uh, the Spanish fourth uh, internet service provider. Uh, from 98 to 2003, uh, he was the internet manager for the second telco carrier. And from 2003 uh, onwards, uh, he has been the Internet Research Fellow at Stanford University. And uh, from 2009 onwards, he has been the President of the Board uh, of the Internet Society. So, without further ado, Mr. Andrew Ver. Thank you. So, <clears throat> good evening. I would like to speak to you today about something that is probably not very well known, which is the history of the Internet. We all think that we know that everything started because the Cold War, but there are a lot of myths. So, today, I would like to start breaking some of these myths, know the past uh, to build the future, and introduce you a new way of creating history. These are my goals for today. The Internet probably is something that you know it's a pure American invention, which is, was built to withstand a nuclear attack. It's, as you know, it's the daughter of the ARPANET. And the Internet created, was created by a small bunch of people at a public agency. When? It was born in 1969, 44 years ago, and it was born with the packet switching. We could discuss all of these six sentences. As you will see when we finish, you will probably have a different vision of all these statements. I started this when Bin Cerf, who created the TCPIP at Stanford in 1974, asked me, well, he, he made the prologue of my thesis, my doctoral thesis, and then he liked it, and he said, why don't you come over to Stanford? So I kept interviewing a lot of people, all the, by, all the people who did something on the internet, and making, recording them for the future. This is what, what we do. This is my office at Stanford. And <clears throat> imagine... How can you imagine the, the internet, the network structure internally? It's a big brain with something scattered? No, it's not at all. It's more distributed. This is like my project. My project is a network of people who are connected, but not a full mesh, not all connected. It's distributed. So this is our pioneers social network that we are creating among Europe, Americas, and OCD countries. And now we are also in Africa, researching the pioneers in each country. So let's start. What if, you, if I ask you to show or to imagine, how could you imagine the internet? The internet with an image would be something like this. Imagine a network of pipes. Right? If we are talking about water, that would be a nice place to, to, to imagine. And this is the internet, and you probably know that the internet was created, and then if in the Cold War something was dropping a nuclear bomb, all the things that uh, after the bomb uh, should still work, right? Well, no. This is a myth, okay? This is not the origin of the real internet. The real internet started what we call uh, the prehistory of the internet with different people in different countries researching about what we call the packet switching. Hmm? Packet switching uh, is a shared, has a shared paternity. Hmm? Different people from MIT uh, were working on this. Donald Davis here in London, in the National Physics Laboratory, created the concept and even gave the, the name to packet, uh, packet switching. And also Paul Barron at the nuclear, uh, sorry, at Rand Corporation in Los Angeles, in California. He was uh, researching, in that case, 
for withstand a nuclear attack. In that case, uh, he, he wanted that. He made to create a robust network. That's why it, it comes from here, this uh, nuclear myth. Uh, but it's, the origins were not really that. Uh. So if you can see in one of the, my interviews with Larry Roberts, he says it's totally false that the internet was created by the military to withstand a nuclear war. And then why they created this? Well, imagine that we are in 1968, exactly, April 12th. These guys, two hours missing at the Pentagon, at the IPT office. IPT office was the information processing techniques office at ARPA, and ARPA was uh, an agency of advanced projects of research. And every time that they did computer science, they asked for a grant, they need to buy a big computer. And this big computer cost like 84% of the grant. So they ran out of money. They couldn't put a computer in 144 universities. So every time that they put a computer, these are the originals, they put also uh, a, a dumb terminal at his office. And Bob Taylor, who was pretty unknown, had these terminals and they said, why we don't create a unique network to connect them and make what they call resource sharing. <coughs> so he's Bob Taylor in 1969, and actually. And after that, he went to Sherrox Park. These are the real, the true beginnings. <coughs> they created the ARPANET, eh, the network that got united all these people from different universities. And they created, this is the first router. You see the second picture on the left is like a fridge. That would be the first router. In 1969, here in London, Donald Davis and his team not com they couldn't convince the British PTT, and then they couldn't make uh, what they would say. Uh, in that case, this would be the first, uh, not the ARPANET, would has been the first packet switch network. Mm? But they couldn't get granted, and they couldn't make it. In Europe, here, we, we lost our first time to be the, the first. That was in 1969. The BBN team, the company who created the first router. Uh, the router was something like this. Uh, as I'm telling you, it's more than a fridge. More. And what happened? Then they created the ARPANET. In 1969, September the 2nd, they connected, imagine this big computer, it's a room, with another computer in UCLA. Both were in the same campus, so it's not really a big issue here. But within the IM, what they call the router. That was the first installation of at UCLA. But it wasn't until October the 29th that they created two hosts at the SRI at Stanford. In that case, you can say, wow, this is the anniversary of the internet. Not really. This is the anniversary of the ARPANET, which is another network. And this network was complete. And if you get two instances of this ARPANET network, they were not compatible. So is this a network of networks? No. Then it's not the internet. So first myth, the ARPANET is not the internet. And the internet was not the derived from the ARPANET. OK? That's important to know. Remember. This is no new technologies, 1969. Well, to sketch a map at the time, it was pretty easy. As you can see, December 1969, there were just four nodes of this ARPANET with, uh, at UCLA, at SRI, at Stanford, at the University of Utah, and the University of California in Santa Barbara. These were the four nodes. And you can see from the user manual, these were the real computers that were connected. These pictures were the, the imagine that in 40 years, it reaches more than 100 millions of hosts. 
The last time I saw somebody trying to sketch the internet was something like this. And these are subnets. It's not really computers at the end. So you need more, more space to, to, to try to, to, to draw this. What else? Imagine that the first internet, we could say, it was created in 1977, September, when they joined three different networks with the three different access technologies. As we can see here, there was the ARPANET in pink. This is the original draft, so uh, you probably have never seen this. But in yellow, we have the packet radio network. And then in green, we have also the, the other uh, network, which was through satellite. It was called SatNet. If you connect SatNet, PRNet, and ARPANET, all together, then you are creating an internet. And we could discuss if this is the anniversary of the ARPANET also. There were three people here, the key people. Who we, we interviewed them also. And imagine, in the case of the packet radio net, it was, uh, they, it was hidden within a, a, a ban. Huh? You see? Sounds familiar. So this was the original band. Uh, this is being served a little younger that you will probably see him tomorrow. It's 1977 SRI. And we have here a special guest with us today, who is Louis Poussin in France, who created the Cyclade. Cyclade was, as he says, the French efficient version of this ARPANET. Okay? So he removed all the things that were not going well or were not efficient. And he created the Cyclade, uh, uh, packet switched network also with different hosts. And he also coined the concept and invented the concept of the datagram. Hmm? Cyclade was, at the time, really well known. We have here from the Tokyo University a uh, protocol comparison. And you, you can see Cyclade and the ARPANET. Okay? So it's probably you don't read it well. <laughs> in Japanese, but at least you can see uh, that it was part of the, the important thing. Uh, here we can see Louis with all his team and during the interview. And well, we call now the internet, but Louis called it the catenet, the concatenated network. Mm -hmm. It was a different uh, network of networks where we could put a gateway between Cyclade and ARPANET and the NAP, uh, National Physics Laboratory network, the three networks that they were at the time, connecting them. But later on, it was created from the catenet to the internet, internet work, and we are using the internet. So imagine that the principal idea, it was pretty simple, was connecting one single person to the other single person in another network. Hmm? And that was the, the idea, to, to be able to talk to a, anybody in other networks. So the four golden rules of this new protocol is that each network should be kept without any changes when, when you, you connect to the ARPANET. So we are still the same when you connect to the internet. Communications uh, were based on the best effort. Hmm? And also, the networks would connect through blue black boxes. And these black boxes is what we call routers today. Mm -hmm. And there is no global control of, uh, of this network on uh, operational level. So in 1974, Bitserf and Bob Kahn created this a protocol for packet network interconnection, which is a seminal article paper, which is called the TCP. Mm -hmm. And it's, we know it today as one of the more important protocols working. Other important people was uh, John Postel, for instance. For more than 30 years, he ran the DNS, the domain name servers, uh, in his office. Also, a professor at Stanford, Norm Abramson, uh, was the person who went to Hawaii. He was a, a little bit I would say bored, but he started the first packet switched network. Uh, it was via radio, and it was called AlohaNet. Okay? From AlohaNet, 
we later on uh, you will see that other persons like well you will see here is the, the hard part of my my job uh, to visit all the people wherever they are and as I, I was telling you in 1972 Dave Box and Bob Metcalf created the Ethernet why the Ether it was the Ether it was by air later on it was by cable and 40 years later we are with Wi-Fi WiMAX we are again through the air so it's Ethernet okay we can see them here when they sold the 100 million units at 3Com of Ethernet. They have it even in the plate. And later on in 1984, Paul Mokepetris created the DNS. Okay, the DNS is something that many people don't know, but every time you send an email, you are using his invention. 1990, uh, this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, put together things that were existing already. It's the multimedia, and also the internet, and also the hypertext. Everything was existing, but he mixed it right, and he created the HTTP, the protocol, to put all together. This is the first server. And again here, uh, in Europe, we lost uh, an important asset when he uh, went out uh, from CERN, and from Switzerland, and went to MIT where he established what they call the World Wide Web Corporation, 3WC. In 1994, uh, well, an engineer, young engineer, Mark Andresen and Eric Bina, had created the Mosaic. And the Mosaic later on became the Netscape, the Netscape browser. Probably some of you uh, know it, but uh, there was a big war between the Internet Explorer from Microsoft and Netscape browser, what they call Netscape Navigator. 1995, Jerry Young and David Philo, also from Stanford, they created a, yet another holistic object-oriented system, which is called Yahoo. 1996, that was uh, the first New Year's party. 1997, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, also from Stanford, uh, <coughs> electrical engineering department, they created Google. It was google.stanford.edu. That was the first domain. Later on, it's google.com. Actually, it looks like this. You can bring your bike uh, to work. You can even have your dog. So learn lessons. We can demonstrate empirically that even it had a military funding, since its origin, it never had a direct military application. The goal was to resource sharing. And if it was for uh, the business world, internet wouldn't exist right now. And it's not only a North American inven invention. We have the packet switching here. We have other networks equivalent. Even Telefonica uh, in Spain created the first network globally. The packet switched network worldwide was the first was created by Telefonica in Spain. <coughs> the web was, was created here also in Europe. And also, to reach success, it doesn't require a huge investment. It's a brilliant, brilliant ideas and a lot of work. The network economy does the rest. Hmm? Doesn't exist a centralized government in the internet. It's meritocracy. If you work more, you decide more. Open source was the key of the expansion and the innovation. And we thought the intervention of the public administration, which they were funding all this technology during decades, we couldn't benefit of the internet right now. And uh, multiple ex internets exist, the commercial, university, association. And all this has been researched by WeWill, which is who is who in the internet world, which is have a research program that we focus on each region, and then we contact all the internet pioneers. Here, for instance, in London, in the UK, we have that uh, in July the 25th, 1973, would be the first connection of the first, uh, I would say, non-American imp. And the imp was the router. Uh, you put a router here, a big fridge. Hmm? The first one that was out of America was installed here in London. 
the UCLA, uh, UCL, University College, with Dr. Peter Kirstein, and they created these notes here. We have them here, Peter Kirsten, also <coughs> Roger Scanlebury, ba Dr. Barber, and Donald Davis from the National Physics Laboratory, were also uh, the team of pioneers that created the NMPL net. Okay? The, the one that I told you that they didn't find the proper funding to, to make a big network. These are the heroes, eh, the local heroes in the UK. Okay? This team, Derek Barber, Peter Wilkinson, Keith Bartlett, and Roger Scanlebury, are the people who created the NFL, eh, the National Physics Laboratory Network. Also the CERN. The CERN, at this time, 85% of the network was within the CERN. So it was a big hub in the 1990s. Even people don't know that. It was really the, the hub. Hmm? Imagine, 85% of the European international bandwidth of all Europe was switched through this building, building 513. Remember, some of you guys are pretty young, but probably still can remember the BBS, eh? the bulletin board systems. No, not at all. What? <laughs> this was how you could look at the the first attempts to, to these online systems. Hmm? But you probably don't remember this, neither. This is how you connected to the internet at home. Okay? You had what it's called an acoustic coupling. Right? You had a modem. You put your phone. Eh? You connect it acoustically. Okay? And imagine, this was working. was running at 300 bits per second. We're talking about now those high-speed networks at 30 gigabits per second. If you count, this is 100 million times. Within a time, a time life, I had been working with this, these things, and I'm working now with the others. So imagine how with the one single person can see how the evolution is. Here we have it with my patron and mentor, uh, being served at DC Lincoln Memorial. And <coughs> what's our goal? Our goal is to collect all these stories of the internet pioneers in a digital audio format. So we have to preserve this for the future, for the new generation. Imagine that now you could listen directly to Thomas Alva Edison saying, oh, I invented this bulb huh? because, well, I was trying something else and that he's explaining you directly why he did that or, or, or for what. Huh? So imagine that you can listen to that. That's pretty easy. For the first time in history, all the people who change our lives are still alive. So we can interview them. We can record the voices. We can take pictures. We can create a huge timeline sort database or a repository that, in the future, we can be, for historians, we can be searched and, and, and preserved. So our goal is to collect live interviews, same questions to everybody, worldwide pioneers and to reach maximum dissemination. And these interviews and have to quick to access, easy to understand, equally structured, and from primary sources. And what's more important is all digital. It's text, pictures, audio, video. We have our own methodology, <coughs> which has been improved for more than 10 years. And the results are all these multimedia documents that we are creating with all these text, audio, pictures, and artifacts. We are doing international dissemination of this work. Imagine from 1964, he passed away two years ago, Paul Barron. So we are looking for internet pioneers, if you want to join us. And we are trying to preserve all these things. This is the first hmm, IP phone. The first iPhone? No, the first IP phone. Okay, it's uh, in 1975. We are talking, quit talking about new technologies. No, this is from MIT, and it was used through the ARPANET in 1975. We are a, a, uh, a team of uh, people from many places: Indonesia, Norway, China, South Africa, Lebanon, Ecuador, Canada, 
And we have got a few hours, international hours, from the Internet Society and a few others. And the last publication we have done is uh, a new book, which is called How We Create the Internet, which will be launched in a few months, where we put all these people all together in the same book with all these materials. And we focus on each person. With Duke Engelbert, he passed away a few weeks ago. Our friend, Ray Tomlinson, created the email. Everybody is using the email, but probably you have never heard about the author of the email. Also, the creators of the router, the first router, first fridge, as I say. <laughs> and the nice thing here is that you can listen directly to their voices. Okay? If you have a cell phone or a smartphone, you go through the code, and then you can listen to the original interview directly. He's explaining why he created that protocol, that service, that idea. Okay? In the future, that, uh, it's going to re be really important. The guys who gather here today, I, I can tell that you, you can talk to Mr. Pusin, who is here in the audience, which is uh, the foremost in the left. And you have the, the time to, to discuss with him and to tell, or ask him things, why he did that or something like that, right? And finally, uh, this book is full of infographics and putting a lot of information within a small space uh, to see all the protocols that had been created. You can see here that since 2001, nothing important has happened. Can you see that? The POP3, the web, the Gopher, BGP, IPv6. IPv6 is old. IPv6 was created in 1998. Wi-Fi 1999, and 2001, WiMAX. What else? Can you tell me something? Putting information in this uh, way, it, it gives you a lot of uh, more information. There's a lot of people that we have interviewed already, 320 pioneers. And we have more than 50 volunteers, 10 core team members and 320 pioneers already interviewed. So we need these unknown histories from Britain, from Great Britain, from, from everywhere in the world. We collect all these important emails, which mark a milestone, and we put all of them together. So to finish, I would like to share with you that the opportunities come to those who are prepared. So get ready, because the internet is not going to be the internet anymore. We'll call it the Earthnet when Bin Serf and his team at NASA, Caltech, and Jet Propulsion Laboratory will create the interplanetary internet. Okay? Every time that we go to Mars, why don't we bring a little box with a TCP IP, with hacked TCP IP, because what happens when a planet disrupts the connection for a few hours or two or three days? You need to hack a little bit the TCP IP so you have these uh, disruption tolerant networks that can resist all these things. Thanks so much. And if you want to have some questions, uh, I will be more than happy to, to answer. Thank you. Is there any question? Is that here one? That's okay. Yes, please. Thank you um, for the talk. I uh, just wanted to know if Pymax is on the list, why not LTE, LTN band, all these new, um, I don't know, IO. Uh, raise your voice, I can um, even listen to you, please. If, if uh, Wi-Fi and WiMAX is on the list, uh -huh. why not LTE and LTE Advanced uh, could make it to the list, which is just um, yeah. really uh, new you're, technology? You're uh, right, you're right. It could be, could be. It's more general, it's more, but you're right. It's not they're, not... they're not really new technologies, they're just like... Uh, they're, they're the Evolu evolution, right? Yeah, they're the yeah. evolutions, but there are new... Uh, ways that we're looking at IoT, the Internet of Things, 
right now the sensors that we are expecting in 2020, uh, 50 billion of them, how are they going to be multiple access uh, onto the network? It's, it's mm -hmm. a very big challenge. Yes. And at the same time, there are some new, to, new um, radio access technologies that allow them to, to come up. So weightless and all these new technologies, they, I think, I think they could make to your list. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, no. <laughs> Any other idea or question? No? Thank you so much for coming. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>